Welcome, welcome back, uh, Excellency, Honorable Minister, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're now going to move over to uh, a panel discussion which, um, which will get kind of interactive as, uh, as, as the session goes along. And I, I think the, the first person that I ought to introduce is Neil, Neil Hume, who uh, is the Commodities Editor of the Financial Times. Uh, as the moderator, he chairs a lot of important commodities meetings around the world, and uh, we're very lucky to have him with us today. Um, the others on the panel you've uh, already met. There's Tom Abanese of Vedanta, uh, Dr. Casolo of uh, ZCCN, and um, John Gladstone is suddenly Brad Mills, or rather Brad Mills is suddenly John Gladstone. And uh, so we Brad welcome Mills. him to the panel as well. Um, I'll now leave you in the good hands of Neil and um, I hope that uh, you enjoy the session. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I don't think there's any need for any more addresses from any of the panelists. I think you uh, probably know who they are already. So we'll just go straight into the debate. And Tom, if I could come to you first, could you just um, give us a bit more detail and, and, and just, just a, a few more ideas of why you know, Zambia is a place that Vedanta has invested in and wants to continue investing in? What are the, what are the real opportunities? Thank you, Neil. I'm, I'm going to start off with um, maybe a little bit on exploration, uh, because ultimately you should go where Mother Earth, Mother Earth put the copper, and they put the copper in the copper belt. Um, my, in my first job was, at the age of 17, was in the sector, was in copper exploration. So I've, I've always had an interest in that the whole picture on exploration, and where, because that really drives where the potential is. And I'm glad to see a number of my geologist friends in the room today who are actually scouring and thinking about scouring uh, Zambia in exploration for, for new deposits. So, so that's, that's really encouraging. Um, I, I, I think that if you look around the world, it is seen as one of the most prospective places. Um, there was a, um, a ranking of best practice mineral potential index where it's seen as the, the, the top uh, country to explore in Africa. And globally, uh, you know, it, it's, it's about the 18th ranked out of 122 countries. So, so the, the geologic perspective is there. The other two pieces um, are, are also there, um, and, but I think they always have to be worked on. The first is uh, political stability. Um, as we've heard, um, Zambia uh, had uh, basically gone through independence without uh, some of the trauma you've seen in other African countries. And I think that tells you that it's a country that is, um, it, it, it seeks resolution and it seeks progress on a constructive basis. And I think that, you know, in its, in its uh, long multiple decades um, since independence, it has been seen as one of the most uh, politically stable countries in Africa. And that does make a big difference. And certainly for an investor who's looking to develop something and look to find something that could lead to a 50-year resource, you're looking for that as, as certainly a hallmark. The second is fiscal stability, and I think we had some good discussion today that the importance of fiscal stability, uh, there, there had been, you know, again, some noise over the past couple years, but I've certainly been encouraged by this government's uh, recognition that to seek that, that, that requisite in investment uh, from the world's capital markets, it has to continue to demonstrate fiscal stability over long periods of time. So I'd certainly be encouraging the government to be seen as one of the most fiscally stable um, locations in Africa to match its uh, most, most stable political system. And then with that, you have the capabilities, the capabilities of the people. You have the infrastructure in place, and you have basically a, a, um, a strong established uh, recognition that mining is important to the country. Now, again, there will be needs to improve the infrastructure. We heard about power. We, we you know, we certainly we can see value in the, the the government's efforts to improve the road road system and also the rail system. All of these, for me, mean that Zambia is a great place to invest. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, uh, Dr. Pius, if I could just come to you now, can you give us an idea of when you're talking to potential investors in, in ZTCM, what what it is? you're saying Zambia can potentially offer them. Can you give us an outline of, of the opportunities? Yeah, like, um, the, like Tom is saying, um, when you want to see elephants, go to elephant country. 
when I was studying geology, I was, I was told that, you know, don't, don't go to, to the sea and expect to mine copper or whatever. You go where there's copper and they're going to find it. So if you aren't looking for copper, you go to the copper country, which is basically Zambia and DRC. And um, the difference between DRC is very apparent. I'm not going to talk on behalf of DRC. I'll, I'll talk on behalf of Zambia. Mm. I've been away from Zambia for a bit of time, um, but I still regard Zambia as my, my country. And uh, when I was asked to come and uh, work for ZSCM, I kindly obliged. And I looked at the opportunity, and the opportunity is the opportunities most of the people here will be seeing in Zambia. The best one is you got the grades, you got the copper deposits in Zambia, you got other minerals. Uh, Nobody thought there was gold in Zambia, but uh, First Quantum, one of their products is uh, gold in um, Kansanshi. There are also other minerals such as emeralds um, are shown, can verify that um, apart from the Colombian emeralds, whatever, Zambian emeralds, one is becoming one of the most sought after, uh, I think, commodity at the moment in gem gemstones. And then there's um, potential of um, oil as well. In the, in the Rift Valley, valley you, you, you had um, um, Talo finding oil in uh, Uganda and so on. And it's the same Rift Valley which is extending da down to Zambia to Malawi. And as the minister said, the, the licenses are being given and chances are, chances are you get oil there. Then you look at the government's policy as well. The minister alluded to that, of which uh, the SSM rides on it. We Whatever you invest, you can take it out. They're ready to uh, foreign, foreign exchange control. Um, the regulations in Zambia are straightforward. Um, you walk in the minister's office, you'll be attended to have, I'm not saying because I'm ZSCM, but any time I have a problem, I picked up the phone, phone the minister. If he's not around, you tell me the date to come and see him. And I think most of the people here in the room, my partners, they'll tell you that the government is very, very friendly to investments and uh, we are selling shares and I know that there are people lining outside waiting for me and um, you can see that's the that's the encouragement we are getting in Zambia and um, my point of view is that if you want to do business really Zambia is a place the infrastructure is incredible you know the difference I saw in in something like five years the infrastructure has just been Overwhelming, it's been done. The roads, 8,000 kilometers of roads, the rail system has been done. Electricity, um, uh, ZSCM were involved in a 300 megawatt addition of electricity, and there's another 300 coming on from, from uh, Zesco. So you can see the development is just going on. I, I recommend and applaud the new government at the moment of. Uh, the infrastructure development they're doing. And for anybody who's coming to do mining or any other business, the first thing you look for is infrastructure. If there's no infrastructure, you're wasting time. But Zambia is infrastructure, government policy is okay, the people are friendly, you can see I'm smiling, we're all, we all happy, go around people. So come to Zambia and invest. Okay, thanks for that. Well, if, if we could just now sort of flip, flip, a, uh, flip sides and look at some of the, uh, the challenges. John, if I could come to you. I mean, you're one of the companies that has uh, put some investment on hold, mothballed some of that. Um, and we've heard a lot this morning about the mineral endowment of, of, of Zambia and how it could be, you know, it could overtake the DRC again as Africa's largest copper producer. But um, what do you think the government needs to do to make that happen? Um, I mean, could you spell out perhaps what First Quantum sees as the biggest challenge to, to making that a reality? Thanks, Dale. I mean, first of all, I would say that um, the complexion of um, the Zambian government this year has been uh, uh, one of dialogue, one of openness, one of accessibility. Um, and there are problems. Of course, you'd expect problems in any um, jurisdiction uh, which is uh, focused on, uh, which is resource based. I'm touched on the issue of VAT refunds. We understand that fiscally uh, uh, Zambia is in a, in a very difficult position at the moment. I think VAT refunds is uh, up there front and center as an issue that uh, does need to be spoken about in more detail. Um, we understand as to why we are where we are, but we also um, think that there is 
um, a route to resolution, um, but we'll only get there through, um, through dialogue. And Honourable Yuluma mentioned uh, um, his willingness to engage in, uh, in dialogue earlier on, so we, we fully support him in that. Um, and we've also touched on power and the power infrastructure that exists in, in Zambia at the moment. Um, those that followed the Zambian press will have seen uh, issues such as um, power outages uh, potentially being uh, imposed over the coming weeks. Um, in a country that is hugely well endowed with hydro power, then for some investors that might be um, a, a difficult thing to accept. But I think that uh, when the new power um, uh, uh, sources come back online, for example, uh, mobile collieries, a tessi tessi, I think the days of those power outages will be firmly behind us. So what with the infrastructure that First Quantum and, I, as I say, our partner ESCO has put in place over the last year or so, I think we're going to see an improvement on that, uh, on that front as, uh, in the coming months to, months to years. So I will re-emphasize the vector is in the right direction, but we will only get to where we need to be uh, through consistent and open dialogue, and that's exactly... Uh, what uh, Chris Luma and his government have, are delivering to us at the moment. So, as I say, it's a, it's a complexion of optimism. Thanks. Uh, so, Tom, I mean, the vector is in the right direction, but what else needs to be done? I mean, there have been changes to the royalty system, as we've been hearing today, but we've still got a two-tier system, which I'm probably right in saying is the only place in the world where, where this actually, well, one of the few places at least, where this actually exists. So there's still more that needs to be done to really unlock the potential of, of, of Zambia. Yes, um, I think that first of all, we, we need to step back a bit and look at the appetite in the world's capital markets for spending in the mining sector. Um, and, you know, again, I'm routinely meeting with investors around the world. Um, and even though they intellectually recognize that companies new be, begin to need to begin to grow again, because at some point in time, the supply demand deficit is going to turn and things are going to get tight again, and those that are positioned are going to do the best. Uh, generally, those same investors are saying, but just don't spend any capital to do it. So, so there's not a lot of um, interest out there for the investment of capital, even for relatively low-risk investments in, in stable countries like, like Zambia. So we're dealing in an environment of capital drought. Uh, and until that turns around, it's going to be hard for capital to be uh, coming into any, 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 any country uh, for the mining sector. Uh, that being said, uh, what, what, what I believe the Zambia government can do, and what it, what it is doing, is it's, it's, it's uh, showing a stabilization of the fiscal regime, and I think it needs to continue on that approach. Um, there have been a series of um, expectations that have been built on VAT, on the new royalty regime. Uh, I think it's going to be just critical for the government to be seen to be delivering on that VAT message that's already been put in place. And, and that, that's probably the single most important thing. Both the VAT post-February 28th, in terms of the, 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 the parliamentary agreement on, um, on reimbursing that, but also the, the large amount of VAT uh, receipts from that, that period of time before then. The government's watching. Or the, the, the world capital markets are watching, and resolution of that will, I think, do, do quite a bit in terms of stabilizing the situation. It's going to be about um, the government continuing to show that stable force in the fiscal regime. Um, the world already recognizes the stable political nature. And again, conferences like this and continuing to make itself known. Because I do believe the, circle, the cycle will change. There'll come a point when the capital markets will say, it's OK, it's time to invest. And, and, and Zambia should be first, first in line. OK, um, thanks, Tom, for that. Um, I mean, the VAT issue is interesting. I mean, I mean, perhaps some members of the panel could speak to how the relationship between foreign mining companies and the Zambian government is evolving. Because certainly when I talked to the FT's correspondent in, in the country, uh, one of the things he said to me was that there, that there seemed to have been a belief within the government and some members of the population that mining companies had, had avoided paying their, their full dues to the government and some of the, the VAT was being held back. Um, I mean, John, I mean, is that, I mean how, how is that changing? In terms of the relationship between the mining in terms of relationships between the mining companies, um, the Chamber of Mines, I, I must uh, applaud the Chamber of Mines in, in the way that they've uh, stepped up to the plate over recent weeks. Um, I think we're closer than we ever have been before. Um, we speak very closely about these issues. We share um, views. We share standpoints. And, of course, they'll all be subtly different. Um, I think going forward, I must go back 
because the, the capital markets are, as Tom says, watching very, very closely. Resolution is possible. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen next week, but it is possible. So I think so long as we continue to uh, negotiate, to speak, to talk openly and transparently, I think uh, um, through the Chamber of Mines, we're going to see some, some significant progress over the coming months. I think Steve would probably agree with that. Tom, would you like to, yeah, to come in? Yeah, I, and I think, look, I think first of all, um, the industry um, has been part of the problem. And I think as an industry, we're, we're recognizing that we have to actually, uh, with, the, with the Chamber of Mines, uh, be a, as open as we can be about the transparency of our financial reports and our financial reporting. And that's why I really applauded the minister's comments on EITI. Um, because, you know, it, it, think, think about it from a per, the perspective of an average person in Zambia. You saw per capita GDP about $1,800. That means a lot of people are, are living on maybe just a few hundred dollars per year. Um, there's a very large informal mining sector where people are literally getting you know, individual bags of copper per day. And they see us driving around with these 100-ton trucks filled with copper ore. So the immediate response is, we must be making a lot of money. And that, so, that, so that's that visceral response is that we have lots of trucks, we have lot, large, large amounts of kit, we must be making a lot of money. So the average person uh, basically will have a level of skepticism when we say we're not making money. And that then influences, I think, political pressure, it influences civil society, and it influences uh, political policy. So we have to do a better job as companies to show that we're a good neighbor. Uh, we have to do a better uh, job as companies to show we are clearly reporting, and then have that very, very important dialogue, both the public dialogue like this, but also the, the, the private dialogue with the government so that we can actually go through and everyone understands what the financial situation on the ground is and begin to rebuild some of the um, uh, trust that had been broken, I think, over the past couple of years where we were looked at as making a lot of money, but we weren't paying any taxes. And I think that will help us uh, with, this, with this march toward what I think everyone recognizes we're all in the same boat. Okay, but what, what sort of practical steps can actually be taken to, to show that? I mean, it, it's, it's all very well speaking about it and, and making the point that at the current copper price, it is difficult for, for mines in the country to make money, and in, indeed, most of them probably aren't generating much cash. But, I mean, how do you show that to, to the populace? I, I think we, as the industry, have to probably do a better job of communicating in the language the average person understands the economics and our own financial position. And I think sometimes, and Stephen and I have had this conversation, uh, you know, sometimes we will publish financial reports, but unless you're a chattered accountant, it's hard to tell what they mean. We have to actually put this in a easier to understand language and be, be much better in our communications, our public education. And again, it doesn't happen overnight. You can't, you can't try to do something overnight and expect it to be fixed overnight. It just takes time to actually build that level of trust. And um, yeah, John, if sorry. If you I'll just echo what Tom says. I mean, certainly, because we operate up in the northwestern province, which is one of the most um, rural areas in the whole of Zambia, getting that message back down into the, the, uh, uh, um, the microcosm of Lusaka is enormously difficult. It's a lot more difficult than you can give it credit for. And so were we to concentrate more and put more resources into communicating exactly what is happening up there, um, then we're going to continue to face the same problems. I, I know the Honourable <coughs> Minister will probably support me when I say um, when he comes up to visit our um, mining sites and when we bring uh, se other senior ministers, they come back to Lusaka having been transformed on their opinion of what we're trying to achieve. Now, it's all very well getting that message through to ministers. It's now our job to get that message to the ordinary Zambian because that is what's going to um, gain their support and re-establish trust for the mining industry within Zambia, which, after all, belongs to Zambia. Um, Pius, is there a part for your company to play in this education process? Well, yeah. The, the first time I came in, um, what I found out was there was this perception which said uh, there were the mining companies which said us and looked at the SSM them. And the first time I met uh, Phil Pascal, we had a chat and I said, I took him for lunch. And I said, we, you can't be you and us. We, I'm a shareholder in your company. 
So it's us. We, the bottom line is for us to make money. And if you make money, everybody, it's a win-win situation. Even though my company's the majority shareholder is government, I'm just, they are, they are shareholders. That means that the Zambian people are shareholders in my company. At the moment, we now have got uh, the, the pension fund. The pensioners who got shares in my company, they want to see returns. And for me to tell them there are no returns every year, there are no dividends being paid, they, they won't understand that. You know, they, they, these are the people who see, like uh, Tom is saying, trucks driving past and all these big houses, golf courses being built. To them, they say, if this can be done, there must be money. And uh, for me, as a CEO of a company, of my shareholders now are pension funds and ordinary Zambians and the Zambian government, and I get a phone call from the Minister of Finance that what's happening, he wants his dividends as well. So what do I say? So the best thing I have to do is go to my friends and go to Tom and sit down with Tom over a glass of wine and say, it's not them and us, it's us. Because if the, if, the government doesn't, if the company doesn't make money, it means this is they won't generate income. So that's what we've started. And um, I flew down to Solwezi, John was there. And I looked, I said, John, you've been doing all these good things to the people. You've been you know, teaching people to farm. You've been putting things in schools and whatever. But nobody sees them on TV. And John says, no, I fly people here in and whatever. I say, you fly one minister in. How many things does a minister have to do? He's got thousands of things to do. Are you telling me you go back to Lusaka and start singing your song? You don't. You have to now work together and put it on TV, show the people what we are doing, so the people realize that the mining industry is doing something for the people. That's what we need to do. We need to show that we have to be visible all the time. But we are not. But I recommend uh, what, uh, for example, KCM and uh, Kansansha are doing. It's incredible. It's not only for those regions. They have sponsored football teams, have done um, other things for the country and things like that. So what we need to is just visibility in whatever we do and people should see what we're doing. But the notion of them and us, that is gone now since I've been around. It's us. I'm part, I'm your shareholder, Tom, and I'm a shareholder of John. So it's us. It's not them and us. Thanks. Well, I mean, I guess one point to make with the presidential election looming next year, obviously, um, this is something the industry needs to, to work on. But, um, Tom, I think you wanted to come in here and say that this isn't a unique experience for Zambia. It happens in other jurisdictions. Yeah, I think that for, for those of you who are not now invested in Zambia, recognize this is not unique to Zambia. Um, Jeremy, as you know, it's been a longstanding topic of discussion in Zimbabwe. It's currently a very large topic of discussion in South Africa, and it's a global topic. I mean, I've been involved with the Australian um, super tax debate, you know, a couple of years ago, and this was front, front paper news, even as someone as mature as the Australian economy. And, uh, and as, I, as we speak, I'm dealing with these issues in India, and you take this issue and multiply it times 1.2 billion people, you can imagine it's a complex issue. So, so this is not unique to Zambia. It's basically a global issue between the private, pri private sector that's making the investment and the uh, owners of the resource, which are effectively the people of those countries. Thanks. Um, if we could just go back to taxation quickly, John. Um, uh, if the government, I mean, we're, we're seeing some changes coming through to the royalty system, but I mean, if, if you could design the system or, or, or make some inputs into it, what, I mean, what would you be saying that the government should need to t uh, consider the stage of the mine's life, where it is in production, as opposed to just having this sort of two-tiered system of you know, open pit underground? I mean, it, surely it needs to be a bit more complicated than that. If, I mean, what would you, your view be? You know, my view is where we are at the moment with the open pit mines with 9% mineral royalty tax is, is abnormally high when you place us alongside, and place Zambia alongside its competitors, and it is. Um, as I've said before, First Quantum, our major investments were all made when the MRT was 3%, which is very much more a global norm. You only have to go north to DRC to see, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't want to take this parallel too far, but you know, a 2% MRT in Congo is, in DRC, is attractive. There's no two ways about it. We're quite comfortable with a high MRT if it's coupled with a low corporate tax and vice versa. But to have them both high does hurt. It does make your eyes water. And it means that profits rev uh, are harder to come by. Um, and that is front and center what will restrict additional 
foreign direct investment, certainly by First Quantum within, within Zambia. But all is not lost. As we've seen, we have a government here that is willing to um, open into, into dialogue. As I say, we're not going to change these things overnight. We are in Zambia for the long term, as I'm, I know that Vedanta are too. Uh, these are long-term issues. These are strategic issues. Um, we shouldn't be uh, seen to veer and haul week by week by week. That, that is producing the instability that is, turns off the capital markets more than any other single thing. I mean, but we say the capital markets might be turned off, but it, it occurs to me with a looming deficit coming in in, in copper, there, there really aren't that many places around the world that you can go and explore actually for decent quality deposits. So doesn't that give Zambia quite a strong hand in when it comes to these negotiations over the fiscal regime? I think that's the exact argument that we used in the 80s and the 90s. Um, and what you saw during the 80s and the 90s was a period where a lot of capital wasn't being spent in Zambia. So Zambia went from being the largest producer to leaving, leaving the South American economies to basically become the largest producers of copper. So again, there is a looming shortage, but again, people do, if they recognize that, they begin to put their creativity to it. They look at different exploration models, they look at different technical models, they look at different provinces of the world. It, it won't. The, the, the shortage won't happen by itself. People will be, be entrepreneurial, and I think it's up to the Zambian um, uh, uh, government and the, and, and the people as stewards of the, of the resources to recognize that, that um, you can't take that shortage for granted. You've got to always be out there showing that Zambia is a good place to invest independent of what that world copper picture is. Because people will, will look and they'll do something differently in Chile. You know, right now they ran out of shortage of water in Chile. What are they doing now? It's desalinization. The costs are regularly going down. You have in every country where, where costs are rising, other people are beginning to think about solutions for those. And, and, and so no, no country can stand, you know, stand still just on the basis of its geologic provenance. It actually has to show that stability. It actually has conferences like this where it's saying, you know, Zambia is open for investment. Zambia wants the investment. Okay, thanks. Um, I think before the panel ends, we've probably got time for some questions. If we have anyone in the audience that would like to ask any of the panelists uh, about some of the issues that we've just been talking about at all. Uh, if not, I will, um, I will ask more questions. I think we've got a gentleman down at the front. If there, is there a microphone at all? Could you just introduce yourself, uh, please, before you ask the question? My name is uh, Chisanga Porochekwe. I have many guises, and on this occasion, I masquerade as director of Consanshi Mines Limited, which is owned by First Quantum. And my question basically is to Jeremy. I was reading about the acquisition of KCM when an Anglo-American corporation left Zambia. I was actually involved in the process of finding an alternative um, owner for, for the mining company. But the the purchase price formula was incredibly complex. Uh, I, I, I read it and I'm not sure that I totally understood it. I wonder, Jeremy, if you could give us a summary of um, the, 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 ac the actual purchase price and a summary of the purchase uh, agreement. Thanks. Jeremy or Tom? Tom. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <Not Tom>. Jeremy. <laughs> Um, yeah, again, uh, let's go back to that point in time. This was, again, more than 10 years ago. Um, this would have been in the 2003-2004 period when the, um, when, when the, when the, uh, the business was being considered in the markets. Uh, I, was in a, I was in a position in a major mining company where I had the opportunity to think about, was this something that we wanted to do? And all the major miners... Um, they had seen the history and they also recognized the technical issues associated with the high levels of water, the cost required to put the shaft in. And, and again, most of the world's mining industry said, we'll pass on this and we'll look somewhere else. And we looked in, we and others looked in South America and other places at the time. Uh, it, was an, it, was, it was before China took off uh, in terms of its economy. So again, copper was seen as old world economy, old world metal, the internet was the, was the big thing. So people weren't investing in the copper industry. And so as a consequence, the, the competitive dynamics 
for any privatization were very low. There was, a, there was an auction process. Uh, if I recall, and Steve, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, but the original bid would have been 40 million up front approximately, and then the overall acquisition would have been over 200 million if you include the various um, you know, subsequent payments that were part of that acquisition. Um, so, so that would have been the, the purchase price based upon, again, the market at that time, which was, if, if it was even a more difficult market than today. We're, we're saying, we're complaining now about, you know, $5,600 per ton copper. Um, at that time, people were celebrating to see $3,000 per ton copper. Thanks. Do we have another question here at, here at the front? Would anyone like to take that? The Chinese investment in Zambia. Um, CNNC, they, quite, they claim they're putting about $2 billion. And, well, um, <laughs> I can't say they put it in because you caught me. So I'd rather say they, they claim. And um, then they've bought, um, there's a, um, another Chinese company that has bought uh, Chibuluma which was owned by Metrorex. Uh, so there's a bit of uh, Chinese investment in Zambia in uh, mining at the moment, yeah. Okay, um, another question at all? Okay, yes, another, another question at the front. Um, do we have the microphone or? You don't need it, so I'll, 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 I'll repeat it, it's fine. Yeah, so it's just a question on potential uh, reserves and, and, and exploration. So, Tom, where, where would you see that? And could you give us a, or Pius, could you give us a figure? Being a geologist, okay. The, the biggest prospect at the moment is uh, Northwestern Province. Um, initially, what had happened in Zambia, they, they, everybody was mining plus 10% 10, 10 copper, and then they came down to five. But uh, first one term, I think they're mining less than 1% copper. And I reckon there's vast chances in the Northwest. And the other places they have to look, but just to be quite deep, deep um, copper deposits is in Luapula because the same, same system, but just um, the sink line has just gone on the other side is deeper. And, and how much copper, undiscovered copper, do you think could be there? I think it's quite vast. There's, we're still a lot of unexplored uh, areas in Zambia. And uh, okay, the grades are low. But uh, with, um, with the bulk mining, they'll be able to make money from that. Okay, Tom, do you? Yeah. I'm going to make a general statement, and that is if you look at the history of all the world's great copper deposits over the past 30 years, generally they've come about because someone has t tweaked that geologic model or asked the question, is that right or wrong? And that's when the big, when, when you tweak it, you begin to get new ideas. So the, the theory that there is a single copper belt, a single, a single you know, sedimentary horizon creating all the copper, it's ready to be tweaked. And I think we've just seen that over the past um, ten, or past five years in, in the, at the DRC side, where uh, you know, a company went in and went outside the normal bounds of the copper belt and found one of the great new copper deposits over the past 10 years. So this is an example of the fact that you, want to, you, you actually want to encourage not only geologists, but also policymakers when they're thinking about the tenement land or that land that should be open for exploration, you know, give, give every opportunity for the models to be tweaked and for people to actually put new ideas to work. John, do you want to touch on that? I would just echo what Tom says. That's exactly what has happened at Consanchi, uh, where we have thought outside the box and, and discovered extra resource. I mean, that, we declared that a couple of years ago. We've been very excited about the way that that's developed. And uh, what I will say is that links into the fact that we must not take our eye off the fact that uh, any mine, certainly a mine the size of Consanchi, needs continuous capital investment. Um, if we are to extend or maintain the, the projected mine life of a, a mine that size, that capital investment must continue to flow in. So that links back to everything that I said previously. But yes, thinking outside the box in terms of exploration, particularly around the Consanchi mine, has, has paid great dividends for us.
Okay, um, right, well that brings uh, to a close the first panel uh, this morning. I'd like to uh, thank my panelists for appearing uh, uh, up here this morning and answering your questions and giving us uh, some further detail on the industry and the opportunities there. Uh, and now if I could just call on um, Simon Perkis, Chief Executive Officer of uh, CNM Group uh, to come to the stage. He's gonna give a short presentation before our next uh, panel. Thank you.